um, please do feel free to use the chat to introduce yourself to, to everyone. I know a lot of people did that last week, and I believe that some, a lot of the people who registered were here for the seminar on decolonizing theory last week. So please feel free to let, also let us know whether, the, whether or not you were at the previous uh, seminar. Angeline. Hello, Helen. Hi. Um, I couldn't find the co-host invite, so I currently don't have power over the recording. No, I've thrown co-host over to Maria because she's going to share the screen for Esmeralda's video, which we've just been um, test running. Okay. Uh, but I started the recording while okay. I I'll clip off the first few minutes. Okay, so I, I won't have the ability to stop it recording. That's the only issue. So you might have to do that. Yeah. Okay. If I don't, you do remind me. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'll, I'll edit it all out. With the previous recording, Helen, I did just look at that today. Okay. Um, and I was going to um, just uh, take out a section in the middle as well as clipping it on both ends. Yeah. We have to break out rooms. And then I was going to create clips for each of the presentations so that there can be shared discreetly a short presentation. Yeah, that would so, be great. Uh, Samson and Esmeralda, that's what we would like to do with your presentations today, if you're happy for us to do that. We'd like to share the seminar as a whole, not breakout groups, but um, in the plenary, but also to make short clips out of your presentations, which we will, of course, share with you so you can um, you know, use that as you wish as well. Is, is, with that, are you happy with that? I can't. Hear you. I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay with that. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can translate perfectly. Don't worry. That's great. Um, so, are you happy for the information so you can use? Um, use the information and all the recordings as they come. So I think everything is going to be made available after the sessions. Todo va a ser, vas a tener acceso a todo después de la sesión. Uh, sí, sí. Vale. sí. Yeah, she says it's fine. Vale. Perfect. Perdóname, estaba hablando en inglés en vez de español. Sí, yo también dije, ya, yo creo que ya no me está hablando a mí. <laughs> uh, sería prudente que digan como... No te escuchas. Yeah, we can't hear you. Ah, uh, perdóname, estaba hablando, estaba um, dirigiéndome a Angeline y a Suranshu. Um, Angeline Suranshu, uh, so Esmeralda is going to be joined by a friend today who is going to be translating for her. Uh, Hello. Hello, friend. Te estoy diciendo que Hello. vas a tener traducción al lado tuya. Yes, Abhiha is also here. Now we're waiting for Gajendran. Um, so, um, Sabiha, for your information, we were just going to go with the order as it was on our Eventbrite page in terms of presentation. So that's Samson, Gajendran, uh, then you, Sabiha, and then uh, Esmeralda, who will be using a, a video. Okay, thank you. Okay. If you have any other questions, then, then, then do ask us now while we're waiting to start. Um, 
Pues no sé, eh, vi que se habían acabado o cerraron el registro. She saw that the registry was uh, closed or that the amount of tickets were like out of stock. Uh, Helen would know about that. Uh, yes, um, it should now be open again. It closed at 5 p.m. last night, but we still have spaces and it's open again now. Que, eh, que lo cerraron, pero como se dice, eh, a las 5 de la noche, pero sí lo volvieron a abrir y pues ya hay espacios otra vez. Mm, okay. para que se registre. Um, if there's someone else you know who'd like to be here who didn't manage to um, register because it was closed for a short while, then uh, you do please um, forward them the Zoom link uh, so, because we, we have spaces, they will be able to join us. Um, el, para, el link como para acceder al video, ese nos lo compartieron. The link to access the video, was that one shared? O el, el link para que se registren y ahí se los mandan. Or just the link to register. Ella dice el link para. Uh, yeah, so the Zoom link. Ah, ok, perfecto. perfecto. Yeah, gracias. Es que lo, y justo ayer en la noche iba como a compartir que iba a estar acá, pero. Last night she was going to share it and uh, it was closed, so she wasn't sure. Yeah, yeah, the only thing is if they register, then they'll get a follow-up communication from us, which we wouldn't be able to do if they've just joined, only joined through the link. Y si registran de esa forma, pueden después eh, conseguir información directa de ellos para estar informados. Okay. okay. Um, we still have participants arriving, so we're just going to give it a couple of minutes while people arrive. If you're, um, for those that are here already, do feel free to use the chat to um, introduce yourself um, and let us know if you were uh, at, the, at the session last week as well. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, there we go, it's back again. Although uh, on our end, your microphone does sound like you're a, a bit far. It sounds a bit muted. Oh, I wonder which microphone. Como con echo, no? Como... Yeah, like, it, like a slight echo. Uh, Angeline? Yes. Is that better? Yes, it's a little bit sharper. Thank you. Yeah. I've got two monitors, they each have a microphone and I have no way of knowing which one I'm using. That's probably, you're probably using both and that's what's creating the echo. No, it's only using one, um, it, it, but uh, it, obviously one will work a bit better than the other. Oh, of course. Great. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the second, I don't know whether we call it a seminar or a webinar, this day and age, I never, I'm never sure what terminology to use, but welcome to the second in our seminar in our series on decolonizing research uh, that's hosted by the Southwest Doctoral Training Partnership in the UK. Uh, my name is Angeline Barrett and I'm the uh, Deputy Director of the SWDTP, but I'm also um, the convener for the series as a whole. So it's my pleasure to introduce the second seminar, which is on decolonizing epistemology. And this seminar has been convened by Maria Ventura Lafaro from the University of Bath and by Shibranchu Mishra 
from the University of Exeter. So I'm going to hand over to the conveners for today to introduce the presenters and to explain that the structure, the organisation uh, that we'll have in the programme for today. Thank you. Thank you, Angeline, and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session on decolonizing epistemologies. Uh, the discussions in, in the session uh, will engage with the active process of decolonizing knowledges by presenting alternative epistemologies and praxis emanating from the Global Sub. Our, our attempt here is to offer a critique uh, of established dominant epistemologies uh, showing how they contribute to forms of colonization, past and present, and limit uh, possibilities uh, for research. And the discussion today will look at examples of non-dominant and non-dominating ways of knowing, uh, which are slowly gaining presence in the contemporary in contemporary research. A few ground rules uh, before I hand over to my colleague Maria, who will be moderating the session. The session is going to be recorded, so please, uh, when you're not speaking, uh, keep your microphones on mute. If you have any questions, please post them uh, in the chat box or raise your hands. Uh, my colleagues, Siba and Molly, will be uh, browsing through the chat box and collect them during the question and answer sec session at the end of the plenary session. And after the plenary session, we'll put you in breakout rooms. Each panelist will lead a breakout room and uh, they can move to other rooms if required. Uh, the purpose of the breakout rooms is to you know, get to know other people who have similar research interests. Uh, so that, so the, the, these are the ground rules. I will now request my colleague Maria to please introduce the session and our speakers. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Shubhanshu. Um, as Shubhanshu has already mentioned, the purpose of this event is to engage with an active process of decolonizing epistemologies. Uh, when Shubhanshu and I were planning this session, we thought a starting point for tackling this task was to inquire some not so simple fundamental philosophical questions, such as what is knowledge, how is it built and by whom, with what purpose, and ultimately who decides which knowledge is valid. Today, we pose several questions to the panelists, which will guide the presentations to understand how we can engage in decolonizing academic knowledge. These are, what does it mean or imply to decolonize research and knowledge in your own field? Can the academy be decolonized? How can we achieve epistemological pluralism and transnational solidarities? And finally, how can we all become more involved in decolonizing praxis and knowledges outside of or alongside academic theory? The panelists today will answer some of these questions from their own experiences and expertise, and we'd like to invite all participants to reflect on the same. We're joined today by Samsung Pondo, uh, Jaran, uh, Katendran uh, Ayaturai, and Sabiha Luce. Uh, and Esmeralda Maria Martinez Gutierrez. Uh, Santos Mopondo is a professor in the political science department at Vassar College in New York. Uh, his research is guided by an interest in colonialism, race, and the mediation of estrangement, with an emphasis on violence, ethics, and diplomacies of everyday life. He engages the problematics of humanitarianism, the politics of redemption, and the popular and popular culture in urban Africa. Uh, Gajendra Atutai is a professor at the University of Göttingen in uh, Germany. He studies the history and anthropology of modern India, examining the problem of caste and why, how, and in which ways privileged castes homogenize and perpetuate marginality. He was awarded a PhD in anthropology from Columbia University in New York 2011 for a study in Tamil Buddhism in modern India. His research themes focus on the experience of Tamil people in South Indian cities particularly those who are, were ostracized and categorized as untouchables and the literacy and social movements. Sabiha Aluche works in the fields of gender and sexuality studies and Middle East politics. She's an inter interdisciplinary researcher who works, whose work bridges the gap between political analysis and anthropological writing. While being primarily situated within feminist and queer studies, her work engages with feminist approaches to violence, conflict, migration and social mobility. Dedicated to producing the colonized knowledge, she is particularly interested in the racialized, sexed, and gendered logics that constrain international relations, both as a discipline and practice. Esmeralda Martinez Gutierrez works as the dissemination and continuing educator coordinator of the lecture series in human trafficking in the National Autonomous University of Mexico. She is the co founder of Insubordinadas, a hack feminist collective that seeks to decentralize knowledge around the internet and the use of technologies and is also the co-founder of Reina Rata. 
uh, Trans Peripheral Collective that works in teaching and virtual dissemination of trans feminist activism and philosophy from a community and capitalist and decolonial approach. As Shrebansha has already mentioned, uh, the panelists will first present uh, for 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, and then we'll go into a Q&A before going into breakout rooms. So if I can pass word over to um, Santa Mokondo. I hope you can all hear me. All right. Uh, uh, thanks, Shubranshu and Maria, for organizing this session and for inviting me to participate on this uh, session on decolonizing epistemologies. Uh, I'll read my remarks in the interest of time, so uh, as to just be able to move it through it uh, a little bit quickly, and then I'll uh, get into more details in the breakout rooms or during the Q&A. So please allow me. And uh, if I'm running out of time, notify me. I'll be able to just stop any, anywhere within that talk. Oh, that's OK. Um, the provocative questions and the setting of a graduate seminar gave me an opportunity to return to some of my earlier work on the relationship between diplomacy and knowledge. They also enabled me to revisit a conversation that I had with the philosopher Viwai Mudimbe a few years back, where we discussed alterity politics, philosophy, ethnological reason, and decolonization of knowledge in Africa. Mudimbe's interest in what he calls African Gnosis, his intellectual odyssey as a convert and uh, a colonial subject, the multiple languages and knowledges that he engages, led me to think more carefully, not only about the condition of possibility of African knowledge in a colonial context, but the structural production of ignorance, what one might call agnotology. It made me to ask a very simple question about myself as a researcher at that point in time. Why don't I know what I don't know about African diplomacies? Similarly, his assertion that no one speaks from nowhere will serve as a reframe for my intervention today, as it was one of the things that provoked me to take certain directions in my own work. To begin with, I would like to cl clarify that when I speak about diplomacy here, I'm not referring to the modern monological concept of diplomacy that privileges the dialogue between states, ceremonial protocol, and the practice of professional diplomats. Drawing upon critical theories of diplomacy that conceive diplomacy as the mediation of estrangement, where estrangement includes not only alienation from other people and other cultures, but also from one's labor, the environment, gods, and knowledges. The text mediated meditation that I engage in today follows and seeks to go beyond the genealogies of Western estrangement and the forms of knowledge, politics, and subjects of the privileges. Doubtless, the broadening of the scope of diplomacy has certain implications for thinking politics and the political. As Costas Constantino illustrates in an essay on diplomacy and its forms of knowledge, uh, here, and this is how he puts it, if politics is about the organization of life in common, diplomacy is about how we live together in difference. It goes beyond the idea and ideal of politics predicated on friend enemy distinctions, and it often involves even talking to the enemy, practices of foreignization, boundary marking and boundary crossing, translation, and investigations that reveal how we are always already strangers to ourselves. Diplomacy involves, and I quote, mediating estrangement while retaining difference. Uh, accordingly, to be a diplomatic subject and to engage in diplomatic knowledge is to aspire to a model of living beyond governmentality. I will turn briefly to the question of difference and its implication for knowledge. But first, it's important to note that the plurality of diplomatic subjects, objects, methods, and cultures that I engage requires that the fostering of knowledge uh, will take place by recognizing knowledge from a diversity of sources and sites. While diplomatic and philosophical frames of recognition often coincide, diplomacy always acknowledges the existence of other knowledges uh, and, uh, and the knowledge of others, what one might call heterologies. It raises ethical and critical questions about the knowledge of the self and the condition of possibility of knowing oneself. Whether one agrees with his overall formulation or not, here, 
we are well served by revisiting the distinction that Edward Said makes between knowledge of other people and other times that is a result of compassion, careful study and analysis for their own sake and those forms of knowledge that work for the domination of the other. Beyond Said's secular, uh, secular humanistic ethic and its emphasis on life affirming readings of otherness, the decolonization of diplomatic knowledge involves questioning, retrieving, and composing other ways of thinking about human beings and beings in general that simultaneously extend and challenge the critical humanist project that Said endorses. Consider, for example, the de decolonial thinking that animates the work of Walter Mignolo, who, in a critique of Renaissance humanism, illustrates how Westerners have defined their locus of enunciation as universal, and in so doing, generated a concept of the human that enables them to maintain the authority to define and name others without they themselves being named. This humanist claim to man is religious and epistemological. It is also the basis of colonial difference and probing its assumptions and mechanics reveals to us the darker side of the Renaissance and, and thus challenges all these diplomatic genealogies that to dwell on the virtues of the Renaissance humanism and do not take into consideration the coeval emergence of modernity and coloniality and the respective genres of man. For the wretched of the earth, diplomacy, just like philosophy and even epistemology is always a manifestation of or a reminder of the double consciousness with which they have to negotiate the world or navigate it, as well as the negative metaphysics that subject them to conversions, negations and negative interpretations. To make sense of what is at stake here, let us turn to V.Y. Mudimbe's Invention of Africa, where he provides a wider scope of African knowledge by focusing on African gnosis rather than epistemology. More specifically, Mudimbe notes that gnosis, which means seeking to know, inquiry, method of knowing, investigation, and even acquaintance with someone and higher and esoteric knowledge should be differentiated from doxa or opinion, and, other, <clears throat> and, and, and on the other hand, cannot be confused with the episteme understood as both science and general intellectual configuration. With a focus on losses rather than epistemology, Mudimbe is able to ask critical question uh, that I'd like that I quote here, what is and what is not African philosophy? He also focuses on the conditions of possibility of African philosophy as part of the larger body of knowledge known as Africanism. The archaeology of African Gnosis that he undertakes illustrates, and I quote, how Western interpreters as well as African analysts have been using categories and conceptual frames that depend on the Western epistemological order. Even in the most Afrocentric descriptions, the models of analysis often refer back to this same order. Or the same order. Of course, there are multiple ways in which this order of knowledge can be subverted and extended both knowingly and unknowingly by various attempts to illustrate not only the invention of Africa that Mudimbe engages, but also the inventiveness, the inventions and falsifications that Africans uh, have been engaged in in multiple ways. Uh, and not only Africans, but multiple people subjected to colonial knowledge. For instance, Walter Mignolo turns to Mudimbe's work on African gnosis and what he calls gnosology to open up, and I quote, the notion of knowledge beyond the cultures of scholarship through what he calls border thinking. According to Mignolo, alternatives to, world, to, to modern epistemolo epistemology can hardly come from modern Western epistemology itself, given that philosophy has served as a tool for subalternizing forms of knowledge beyond its disciplinary boundaries. Central to Mignolo's formulation is the notion of colonial difference. And here it's, it goes back to what I was talking about, diplomacy and the mediation of difference, but now to take seriously colonial difference that goes into deciding what is or what is not philosophy, human, and in my case, what is considered even diplomatic. Within the prevailing epistemologies, often tied to the Greek paradigm of philosophy as a point of re re reference, the task of decolonizing knowledge cannot be confined to decolonizing epistemologies. As, B as Bignolo puts it, decolonial, works, de decolonial work requires a double critique that recognizes the working of colonial difference. That is, 
decolonization works from the colonial difference and from the double bind between assimilation. And here he's saying that African and Arabic philosophy is sometimes considered too similar to Western philosophy that it makes no contribution. And uh, the other thing is marginalization. Yeah, those who say that it is so different that its credentials will always be in doubt. This being the case, the colonization becomes a work of both undoing colonial knowledge, retrieving other knowledges, and creating knowledges that challenge and exceed the epistemological frame. For Bignola and others, the colonial thinking presupposes delinking epistemically and politically from the web of imperial knowledges and uh, disciplinary management. It is a kind of uh, epistemic disobedience by those marked by the colonial wound. For some thinkers, the task of decolonization isn't only about delinking, and this is where my thinking about diplomacy and knowledge becomes useful. Yeah? It also involves rehabilitating a world of multiple knowledges and people who have been jumped over, erased, humiliated by the negative interpretations and brutalities of colonialism in the past, abandonment, separations, amnesia, and conversions of the present. Part of contesting this violence and its hold on lives involves the composition of mutualities, the mapping of entanglements, and new inventions or falsifications that repair the world, enable the emergence of a new human, and challenge the hierarchies of being, knowledge, and the colonial order. Recognizing that the options against colonialism and coloniality are multiple, political, and always situated, I will want us to be able to reflect a little bit more on those words from Viva Bidimbe that I began with, that no one speaks from nowhere. And this often reveals the positions, investments, and dispositions and condition of possibility of our speech and thought. This being the case, the call to decolonize epistemology should also be accompanied by a more fundamental question. And I'll close here. And this question is that, from whence does our concern and investment in epistemology as a basis of asking how we know or what we know emerge. Similarly, uh, the turn to ethnological reason and anthropological categories as the alternative is worth investigating as it, is of, as it often reveals the working of ethnological uh, reason in the colonies and in post-colonial societies that denies the originary uh, syncretism in the cultures that we focus on. Thank you. Thank you, Samson. And now uh, we'll have the presentation by uh, Gadendran Adaturai. Maria, I don't think he has joined, so maybe we can move to the oh. next speaker. Okay. Um, so, Sabiha? Can you see? Yeah. Um, I would like to start by um, uh, thanking uh, Shubranshu and uh, Maria for organizing this uh, beautiful turnout. Um, very happy to be part of it. And um, yeah, I would also like to uh, begin by um, um, agreeing pretty much with everything that uh, my peer, uh, uh, Samson, have just, um, uh, you know, told us. And um, yeah, I'm going to, I organized a series of answers in line with the questions that we were provided with. So I'm going to start by uh, stating a small, uh, a mini memory, I would say, uh, from when I was uh, much, much younger. And um, so the more I work on my research studies, etc., the more I come across with um, I'm rediscovering, right, the intellectuals from my area, from the Swana area, uh, so Southwest Asia and uh, North Africa, which is in itself a, 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 an acronym that is attempting to decolonize uh, the Middle East, right, from, uh, from, yeah, from the Middle East, as in what is the Middle East, east of what, middle of what, etc. And Swana is more uh, in terms of locating it geographically. Um, but yeah, so the more I work and I come across these names, and every time I come across these names, I remember when I was a child and 
I heard it from the adults around me in random conversations, maybe in a car, on a trip somewhere, on the radio, uh, somebody mentioning this particular philosopher or this particular intellectuals. And yeah, things start to, you know, it puts you on a, on a journey, right? In the sense that what happened in the transmission of these names from my parents' generation to my parents' generation. And maybe this is me coming from the Swana region. Um, this is a region that has been in a permanent state of war, literally from, you know, it began to be invented, right? And maybe my parents' generation was too overwhelmed with the geopolitics of the uh, region. And so this is the, a generation that literally woke up one day to Today you are Lebanese, today you are Syrian, today you are Egyptian, today you are Iraqi, right? And these are very novel and young uh, nation states. And maybe my parent generation was too overwhelmed. And not to add that oftentimes these nations more or less was a, were accompanied with some degree of civil war, internal disagreements, conflicts, um, yeah. So definitely when it comes to my generation, I find myself in, in, a, in, a, in a phase of relearning, uh, but also recuperating all these, uh, you know, whispers, all these ephemeral names, uh, events that do bring back something, but this something hasn't been recorded. Or if it has been recorded, it has not been disseminated enough. And so I think when I think about myself, I think a lot of what I do is really trying to recuperate uh, lost knowledges um, and, um, and hopefully you guys, like for me in your generation, um, the increased dissemination of knowledge that we see thanks to social media, um, you know, online activists, uh, of course it's limited, but the knowledge is being disseminated. And maybe this is me being hopeful, you know, on that, um, uh, in, in that sense. I just wanted to, yeah, begin with that. As far as my discipline goes, so I work mostly on gender and sexuality. And what is gender? What is sexuality, right? And um, it's, it's, it's too broad, it's too narrow at the same time. Um, oftentimes when we want to think about gender, you know, from a decolonial, decolonial, decolonial perspective, what we are really thinking about is the, the, the body, right? Knowledge as very, an embodied form of uh, knowledge. And what does it mean, you know, when we think about the knowledge or the body as embodiment? And um, so, for example, if it's, you know, if, when we think about the body in relation to knowledge, um, speaking, singing, uh, oral history, right? Transmissions, uh, dancing, um, um, being possessed, being dispossessed, all these are different, um, uh, you know, degrees and intensity of uh, physical um, manifestations, right? And when we think about the body, you know, in, in a Western paradigm, in a Cartesian dualistic way, the mind, the body, knowledge, uh, emotions, etc. It doesn't make a lot of sense, right? And when we think about the body as embodied, knowledge as embodied, maybe we should pay more attention to, um, <clears throat> um, you know, to all these, um, basically build the, close the gap, right, between this uh, separation. And I think, for most of us here, we would agree that a lot of the work that decolonial work entails is um, definitely closing the gap between all these very artificial binaries, right, that, uh, that construct uh, our world. Um, everything is neatly categorized, they're separated in labels, and the same goes to our disciplines. What does it mean, you know, to be a political scientist? What does it mean to be a philosopher? What does it mean to be this? So yes, I agree with uh, Samson, and I would go as far as to say that when we want to think about decolonizing epistemologies, we, we should also, it should be accompanied with an ontological shift, 
you know, and it's a totally, totally different way to think about what knowledge is, what knowledge is not. And um, um, yeah, you know, how do we think about the, 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 the things that we uh, think about? And, um, you know, asking from my situatedness in the Swana region, for example, what is woman, what is man, what is sexuality, what is gay, what is homosexual, what is same sex? Um, how do we study gender when the language, with the Arabic language itself does not have, you know, uh, an equivalent in Arabic? Um, does this mean that gender doesn't exist? Um, what if uh, sex and gender are not entirely distinct categories, for example, in, uh, you know, in Arabic philosophy? But also what if they are? But the paradigms that define them and construct them are very distinct, right, from the Western paradigms that um, are, <clears throat> yeah, are, are, are oftentimes a company, right, uh, gender studies. So yeah, it's a lot of um, it's a lot of remedying work. It's a lot of uh, recuperation, and um, yeah, and it's a lot of. Um, being situated right different fronts to work at at the, all times you have to speak to your audience at home to abroad to the to academia and uh, that's not very easy right and of course um, there are certain ontologies but also epistemologies that are very dear to the region that have become synonymous with absolute terror right for example religion Islam, right? It's seen as the ultimate evil, uh, the most immediate existential threat to humanity by being equated, right, with the terrorism, war on terror, etc. And if we think this is a very straightforward and clear example, when we think, for example, about the Islamic revolution in Iran, you know, when we think about it in its context, 1979, 80, this was a revolution that drew on local knowledge, right, Islam, um, as a mode to resist a very capitalist imperialist Shah. And um, okay, today I'm not going to deny Iran is a very theocratic, authoritarian, uh, etc., etc., state. But um, there's an element of the Islamic revolution that was very local, right? This was a type of knowledge that spoke to the Iranian population. And how do you, you know, how do you translate that um, um, to a Western audience, right? Who has since the Islamic Revolution have come to uh, synonymize Iran, Iran with you know the ultimate. Uh, I think it's on one of these countries on the axis of evil, uh, for example. When we think about one of the greatest feminists from the um, uh, Swana region, um, of course we can critique her for lots of things. So when we think about Nawar Sadawi, for instance. Uh, one of, when, she, when her work became increasingly uh, translated into English and sent, you know, for an English-speaking uh, audience or French-speaking audience, all her preface about the Islamic Revolution, um, her nuanced, you know, analysis of the Islamic Revolution, her, her contextualizing analysis, the editors in France and the UK and the US told her, this is not going to be published, you have to remove you know, all this talk about the Islamic revolution. And uh, she did. And uh, is it good? Is it bad? Who knows? Maybe, and I think you will agree with me that asking whether it's good or bad is the wrong question to ask, right? Why does she have to do that? Um, how do we rewrite this preface, you know, nowadays? So yeah, a lot of remedy and work, a lot of corrective work. Um, contextualizing, I wrote a piecing as well, right? Um, uh, what does it mean? Which brings me to my next point. What does it mean when what we produce is increasingly a link to profit making, right? Increasingly linked to um, industries, publishing industries, um, editing industries, um, etc., etc. And one of the questions that we were asked is, do we think do we think that the academy um, uh, can be decolonized? <sighs> well, I'm one of those who have my limits, uh, who, who believe, you know, like um, this is a limited 
um, I don't, I think, I don't think academia can be entirely decolonized, but I do think that we can use our little space, right, to do some sort of uh, impact. And um, there are a lot of things, you know, like I had lots of examples uh, to, to, to generally talk about. And I oftentimes share my experiences with the horrible editor uh, gatekeepers who oftentimes tell me, uh, you should send your work to a Middle East journal, you know, uh, instead of a theory journal, because God forbid, right? You cannot theorize if you're not from the US or the UK or France or uh, wherever. But you also, you know, when you def when you try to defy the editor, so you send these emails back and forth, sometimes it works, but it's a lot of work, right? Again, it's a lot of work. Um, it's in addition of, you know, you know, to your workload, to your contract, to your expectations, um, having to justify yourself, uh, writing literally two, three other essays in addition to your manuscript, which is not guaranteed, right? That is going to be published. Okay, uh, you know, to get this answer um, um, uh, from the editor that, uh, okay, right, I will send your manuscript now for, uh, but also sometimes you want to critique um, even in non-academic uh, uh, spaces, um, important names um, and editors are very reluctant to give you a space. Um, you know, trying to save face, um, not wanted to be in uh, you know, tension with the big names. Um, if the big names themselves are the ones who get the biggest grants, no one is going to stand uh, by your side. Um, and um, yeah, and I don't blame them, right? We all have to pay our bills, we all have to survive somehow, or maybe you should blame them, I don't know. You know, all these are questions that uh, come to mind, but it also, but this also makes me link, if we want to overcome, right, or widen the limited space that we have within academia, how can we build transnational solidarity? This is also one of the questions that was sent to us. Um, what does it mean, for example, when, um, you know, if I want to work, if I have uh, colleagues who are based in uh, Gulf universities, uh, you know, how can we critique Israel with the normalization, right, of the um, uh, normalization of the relationships between the, these countries and uh, and uh, Israel? So yeah, you know, geopolitics and academia become again, you know, all, almost two sides of the same coin. Um, what else? Yeah, so basically what I'm saying here is, I think when we think about transnational solidarity, but also when we think about decolonizing knowledge, even within the institution, I think we should never forget that knowledge is collaborative always collaborative, you know? You might be writing the manuscript yourself, but when we think about decolonizing, when we think about knowledge as embodied, these narratives that you're drawing upon, these experiences of others, um, many of whom have most probably experienced an extreme level of violence, um, you know, it's almost a post-humus post kind of uh, collaboration. And when we think about the feminist work, particularly, it's always collaborative. And, um, and maybe, you know, this is an opportunity to take seriously, right? And to address it via symposiums or whatever it is, uh, to insist on the collaborativity of uh, knowledge and to get over um, the fetishization of the uh, academic. And, um, yeah, so one of the things that I do in my work, um, in my research, for example, and I know you, most of you are PhD students and I don't want to be horrible, um, but these are unfortunately some conscious decisions I make. Um, when students come, you know, send me their proposal, oftentimes uh, overly saturated, you know, with notions of saving women from the Middle East, saving Muslim women, I really, I mean, I want to, 
I want to understand why, you know, I keep asking them why, why, why? What is it that compel you to go all the way, you know, to the Middle East or the Swana region? What, why do you want to rescue these women, right? And oftentimes they're going to have a very limited answer. And I'm going to give them all my recommendations and readings. Hopefully, you know, we can come to a, to a, you know, uh, something similar, uh, right? A uh, similar place to begin from. Or I'm going to say, no, sorry. But this is not only PhD students at the international level. Very important to acknowledge the role of local actors as well, right? A lot of scholars from the region itself are very much infatuated, right, with these Western liberal paradigms. And if not everyone is invested in decolonial, right, uh, thinking and decolonial work. So this is, you know, this is something that applies. Um, and I'm sure you know it from your friends, from your peers, your families, right? Uh, um, decolonizing is not, it's a lot of unlearning, right? And if you haven't come across it, if you haven't, um, even if you fell into it by mistake, it's not a way of life, right? Because it is a way of life. It becomes embedded in everything you do from shopping to reading to writing to, um, so yeah, both local and non-local actors, right? Are usually involved, unfortunately, in both recolonizing and decolonizing. And um, last but not least, how I try to decolonize. So uh, I try to say yes to all, uh, you know, like any opportunity like this one that comes across, I'm always happy to take uh, part in it. Um, I very much uh, encourage open access uh, work. For example, in general, I, I try for every work that is published in a non open access journal, I try to have at least, you know, and the next work in an open access journal. I don't care how much it scores on the ref. And maybe I can say that because I'm lucky enough to be in a permanent position now. Definitely when I was a PhD student and struggling to find the permanent work, I, I had a very different um, right uh, way of thinking. Um, but it's also doing, um, yeah, a lot of disseminating work. So I do encourage uh, students to and I should teach myself uh, how to do it. Maybe I'm still too junior. Um, write it in accessible uh, language, definitely. Um, avoiding jargon thing. And um, yeah, just a lot of emotional, you know, intellectual work um, with my peers. And it's not easy, but you, you don't take a break from the colonial work, voila. So I'm going to leave it here. Thank you. Thank you, Sabiha. That was very illuminating. <laughs> um, I'm going to... Uh, Maria, I just had a comment. Gajendran is trying to enter, but uh, uh, he's unable to uh, you know, enter the room. I don't know if there is some problem with the, uh, you know, the numbers that can be... Uh... There isn't any... Um, I don't think there's any waiting room. Okay. Um, so you should be able to join at any time. I've just sent you the link again to forward to okay. it. Um, okay. Yeah. Could I play the video in the meantime? Or? Um, okay, well, um, was we have um, Gedinger and Drupna joining us or not, I will just put uh, the next presentation is um, Esmeralda. Um, she will be, she has recorded the video in Spanish and it's been subtitled, so I will just share it with you now. I think you will have received a transcription of the video as well, in case the um, subtitles got a bit too fast. So. Hola, buenos días a todas, todos y todos. Me gustaría agradecer a Shubranchu y a María por la invitación, así como al programa de formación doctoral del sudeste de Inglaterra. Quiero compartir con ustedes reflexiones que son parte de mi experiencia con mis colectivos en los que formo parte. Las he esquematizado por puntos, entonces el primero es sobre las formas de producción de conocimiento popular indígena, campesino y urbano de mujeres diversas 
que se ven subordinadas ante un discurso del feminismo hegemónico, el cual ofrece oportunidades como programas sociales, apoyos y visibilización, pero que ha ido colocando una hegemonía del saber y del rigor científico y occidental sobre sus formas de conocimiento. Son prácticas que nos van siguiendo a pensar desde una razón binaria y asimétrica que no comprende de la multiplicidad de tiempos y de territorios, que no considera las diversas formas de ser y de estar en este mundo. Es un feminismo que nos traduce y nos obliga a traducirnos en conceptos y categorías que sean entendibles y asimilables para sus instituciones, provocando procesos que homogenizan, reducen la experiencia y que generalmente facilitan el uso de palabras y discursos que se vacían de su propuesta política transformadora para ser explicados desde afuera y ser usados en la elaboración y ejecución de políticas públicas, o para que asociaciones civiles y ONGs puedan bajar recursos, o en el mejor de los casos, para que formen parte de una producción masiva de conocimiento muchas veces infértil e innecesario para una transformación palpable hacia las mujeres y sus comunidades. Son prácticas que terminan entibiando los movimientos, legitimando al sistema y que controlan las agendas políticas. Son dinámicas de traducción de la experiencia donde nos narramos y existimos absolutamente para esa otra y sus fines, empleando determinadas sintaxis y asumiendo y soportando el peso que implica su cultura y clase social por encima de la nuestra. Nos volvemos aceptables mientras mejor aprendemos a usar su lenguaje, palabras, tecnicismos y conceptos que describen nuestros procesos internos y colectivos. Pienso en muchas de las investigadoras que se han acercado a mi colectiva y la mayoría no participaba en ningún tipo de grupo, grupo, lucha o movimiento. Algunas de las investigadoras extranjeras no conocían bien la situación ni de sus propios contextos y en muchas ocasiones no pudo generarse un diálogo horizontal con ellas ni ningún tipo de apoyo mutuo. Por el contrario, hubo un extractivismo de saberes y experiencias que no solo eran construidas por nosotras, sino en comunidad con otras mujeres. Fueron discursos que resultaron tergiversados conceptualmente para justificar o sustentar otros proyectos. El punto 2 es sobre la producción de conocimiento académico desde dentro de las comunidades. Hay compañeras que vienen de comunidades y hacen proyectos de investigación que van de visibilizar el lugar de las mujeres en la historia de su comunidad, remembrar procesos de lucha o trazar genealogías de sus ancestras sin cuestionar los procesos de colonialismo interno en quien produce dicho conocimiento. Es decir, en muchas ocasiones son compañeras que no identifican cómo lo hacen, para qué y para quién. Por eso pienso en la importancia de cuestionar si el conocimiento que busca descolonizar puede producirse en la academia, que es la representación y materialización más explícita de la colonialidad del saber, o es necesario que dejemos de separar el conocimiento puro de los saberes ancestrales y que surjan de la praxis política para tener un papel activo, dejando de asumir no solo como sujetos o sujetas pensantes y estudiosas de la, de la, de la decolonialidad, incluso al interior de nuestras propias comunidades. Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui, que es una compañera feminista comunitaria en Mara, dice que no hay posibilidad de una teoría y discurso descolonizado si no hay prácticas que le den sentido. Desde ahí, yo pregunto cómo construir conocimiento desde la subalternidad sin cuestionar las relaciones de saber-poder y las instituciones donde se reproduce. Yo soy consciente de que muchas personas que venimos de sectores marginados trabajamos dentro de la universidad con una intención de subsistencia. De hecho, al menos en México, generalmente la mayoría lo hacen en condiciones precarias. Claro que hay muchos compañeros y compañeras que lo hacen desde una intención transformadora, pero lamentablemente en muchos casos no deja de reproducir jerarquías de profesor-alumno, sujeto-objeto de estudio, conocimiento puro y conocimientos populares, o conocimiento y teoría versus praxis. Y esto es por la misma forma en que está configurada la academia, quién la conforma y para quién habla. Tiene que ver también con una cuestión de colonialismo interiorizado, pero incluso para compañeras y compañeros conscientes que generan o intentan generar posibilidades de transformación con sus estudiantes, se enfrentan siempre a los límites de una institución cuyo papel central es hegemonizar, universalizar los conocimientos y lenguas, producir masivamente capital humano para el mercado laboral y conocimientos útiles al capital, deslegitimar e invisibilizar saberes a partir de procesos burocráticos y de certificación, y normalizar y disciplinar los cuerpos, los deseos y los afectos. Otro punto son las formas de producción de conocimiento desde la praxis. Ahora me gustaría compartirles eh, un poco desde mis experiencias, algunas reflexiones. Lo primero que quiero hacer es preguntar cómo podría hacerse posible el descolonizar y despatriarcalizar la epistemología desde la academia, desvinculándola del movimiento social. 
si podemos hablar de descolonización epistémica sin participar activamente en procesos de descolonización material y subjetiva de nuestros territorios que sean presentes de forma tangible para las comunidades. Si existen formas de evitar institucionalizar la decolonialidad y el feminismo desde las universidades sin que las palabras y discursos se banalicen, sin que pierdan su sentido original o que pierdan su potencial revolucionario. Eh, primero, eh, les comparto mi experiencia desde Insubordinadas. Es una colectiva que tengo con mis compañeras Candy, Sol, Marian y Aura. Y bueno, esta nace en 2016 con mi compañera Candy, Sol y yo. Cansadas de la violencia extrema y cotidiana de nuestros barrios, comenzamos una colectiva que tenía por objetivo construir espacios seguros de enseñanza-aprendizaje con compañeras de barrios y pueblos originarios de las periferias de la Ciudad de México. El objetivo de los espacios era compartir conocimiento de autodefensa entre todas y brindar conocimientos y herramientas de seguridad física y digital. Así hicimos diferentes encuentros, talleres y actividades. Consolidamos un Hub Lab en las periferias de la ciudad donde compartimos conocimientos técnicos y herramientas a muchas compañeras para revisar su privacidad en redes sociales. Muchas de ellas fueron después a ofrecer talleres sobre bordado, medicina tradicional, mecánica para bicicletas o reparación de laptops. Estas actividades nos permitieron hacer redes intergeneracionales y transterritoriales en el aro periférico de la ciudad, desde el diálogo horizontal y el respeto por los saberes de las otras. También generamos encuentros con otras activistas que no solo eran mexicanas, sino de otras partes de Avia y Ala, y que creían que era necesario pensar también Internet como un espacio a disputar al capital, al patriarcado y al colonialismo. Se volvieron lugares para imaginar otras formas de habitar también el mundo virtual y generar herramientas que permitieran construir conocimiento colectivo, articularnos a la distancia y crear proyectos de resistencia y autonomía. Empezamos a generar actividades en espacios institucionales como universidades y museos con la intención de ocuparlos como plataformas que permitieran consolidar más redes de carácter regional y también que nos permitieran visibilizar nuestra postura anticapitalista, decolonial y antipatriarcal en el tema, descentralizando la perspectiva de inclusión a las TIC que impulsaba el feminismo liber liberal sin una propuesta política crítica de transformación. También está la experiencia que tengo con mi colectivo Reina Rata, en el cual eh, participan mi compañero Mike, Dunia, eh, Jen y Laurel. Y es un colectivo que nace en la coyuntura de la pandemia a partir de la conformación de círculos virtuales no académicos de estudio sobre diferentes temas para compartir reflexiones resultado de experiencias personales y colectivas. La coincidencia política y voluntad de consolidarlo radicó en ser también personas ubicadas en las periferias y zonas marginadas de la ciudad, en la crítica común hacia procesos que centran todo su activismo en construir políticas de identidad intrasistémicamente y también hacia el cuestionamiento del discurso del feminismo liberal hegemónico que hace uso de términos como interseccionalidad, los cuales sirven, para, sirven como lugares discursivos acríticos, coloniales, de cooptación y de reforzamiento del sistema de diferenciación de acuerdo a Ochi Curiel, que es una activista colombiana de colonia feminista que son procesos los cuales generan y refuerzan categorías como mujer, negra, indígena, lesbiana, transmigrante, enfermo, etc., sin intentar transformar el sistema que genera dichas diferenciaciones. El objetivo es articularnos con otras y otros colectivos de personas que estén dedicadas a trabajar de forma horizontal, desde y para las comunidades negadas, invisibilizadas y más marginadas de nuestros territorios, es decir, comunidades indígenas, negras, migrantes, personas trans, trabajadoras sexuales, entre otros, para conocer sus saberes e imaginar juntos alternativas a otros mundos posibles. Porque para nosotros la decolonialidad, el feminismo o el anticapitalismo no son doctrinas, no son manuales y no son teorías. Son procesos en un continuo devenir, que están situados en diferentes territorios y tiempos, pero que pueden accionar de forma articulada y rizomática e enraizada a la vez. Lo que queremos es crear horizontes de transformación en este sistema de explotación, violencia, despojo y muerte. Y la invitación es que todos formemos parte de esa ruptura entre la diferenciación, saber hacer, y comencemos a tomar un papel activo en los diferentes procesos que se haga más tangible, material y concreta para las condiciones de vida de las personas. Eso es la, lo que quería compartirles y es todo lo que quiero decir por ahora. Muchas gracias. Um, now, Miranda would like to share with you a quote from Fanon. Oh, that's already shared. So she will be in, we will be, be reading this in Spanish. Okay. 
Ah, sí, gracias. Lo voy a leer en español. El intelectual colonizado había aprendido de sus maestros que el individuo debe afirmarse. La burguesía colonialista había introducido a martillazos en el espíritu del colonizado la idea de una sociedad de individuos donde cada cual se encierra en su subjetividad, donde la riqueza es la riqueza del pensamiento. No ve siempre la totalidad, pero el colonizado que tenga la oportunidad de sumergirse en el pueblo durante la lucha de liberación va a descubrir la falsedad de esa suposición. Las formas de organización de la lucha van a proponerle ya un vocablo inhabitual. El cálculo, los silencios insólitos, las reservas, el espíritu subterráneo, el secreto, todo eso lo abandona el intelectual a medida que se sumerge en el pueblo. Y es verdad que entonces puede decirse que la comunidad triunfa. Y ya, eso es todo. Ahora sí, muchas gracias. Ok, um, so, at the next branch, we have any more news from um, Gajendran? No, I think we can collect some questions now. Uh, yeah. Ziba and Molly. Uh, Hi, we're ready for questions. Can everyone hear? Yes. Great. Okay. Well, thanks very much to the the presenters. It's um, the the comments are full of explosive questions, and you know, every you know, flying back and forth, and even on social media, I've been reading loads of um, you know quotes from from the presenters and what they've been speaking about. So thank you so much. Um, one of the questions, the first question we have on here is um, someone asking, sometimes I get confused with using the following terms, decolonizing, delinking, decentering, um, pluriversality. Some scholars use them interchangeably, while others choose a terminology out of choice to challenge and disrupt power structures but they decide not to call it decolonization. It would be great to hear what the panelists, panelists have to say about that. Who goes first? You can go first, Sabiha, please. Please go first. Um... I think it's a, it's a very important question. And I think it comes from, I think when we are junior and we are overwhelmed with the theory, and the PhD, unfortunately, a lot, a big part of it is about proving that we've done our research, that we've read everything there is. Mm. Um, we become overly, I think, invested in these um, definitions. And my recommendation is, or the way I see it in decolonial work, never mind the definition, ask what these concepts do. You know, what is it that they produce? And um, Ultimately, I think you will agree with me, the, the person who asked the question, but pretty much everyone, that these are very overlapping, um, very overlapping concepts. When you are, are learning, when you are rebuilding something, right, you are literally inventing a new, a new, a new kind of uh, cement, right? Um, these are different uh, tools that you are using, most probably different natural resources, indigenous knowledges, expressions. And so, the, yeah, they have delinking, decentering, re engineering, uh, you know, recutting, reformatting. But I would focus on what they do, definitely, rather than what they are. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I respond? Yes. Uh, th th thanks a lot, Sabiha, for uh, actually bringing it to uh, t paying attention to what the concepts do. 
and uh, with attention to the fact that this is a graduate seminar and people are writing dissertations, uh, you're sometimes overly invested in a citational economy. Yeah. You want to show or display a certain mastery of um, a given uh, body of work. Uh, and the tendency becomes that of being very mimetic. Yeah, you, uh, you know, uh, pretty much regurgitating or uh, working through uh, uh, what other, other, other thinkers have said before you, uh, which sometimes doesn't resonate with the project that you're, that you're doing. And uh, for me, what I think is a more fundamental thing is asking, uh, when you're, what is it that you're interested and invested in uh, as, a, as, a, as a project? And which of these particular formations work best within that engagement? And I will illustrate why, uh, for instance, and uh, I even cited this when you see what people like Walter Bignolo are talking about delinking. Uh, and when you see the work uh, of people like Ashil Mbembe, who for them it's mapping more entanglements. Uh, these do very different type of, type of work. Uh, for instance, if you're interested in decolonizing African knowledges, uh, part of the colonial formation has been based on, uh, for instance, cutting Egypt from Africa, yeah? the Hegelian move. Yeah? Africa has no philosophy and part of it is uh, Egypt has thought, okay, Egypt cannot be part of Africa. Yeah, and the work that is sometimes engaged is, okay, how do you show uh, or illustrate uh, what people like Martin Bernal and others were doing, Afro-Asiatic roots of ancient, civil of, of classical civilization to illustrate how racism worked uh, to pre be able to present Africa as a domain of nullity. So the work of delinking sometimes involves making other connections. Uh, it's not to be very, very married and to just apply the concepts, to interrogate, to do the patient, meticulous work that it involves. Well, at the same time, you know, knowing that when you pursue these concepts with fidelity you know, or too much fidelity, you sometimes actually, and here I will uh, quote what Esmeralda says, you reinforce the very categories that you are writing against. You reinforce the very thing that you're being critical, critical of. So philosophy becomes this thing that one, uh, the condition of possibility of thought, yeah? as if there can be no thought outside of philosophy. Yeah? History becomes the only way that one thinks of connecting to the past. So you're always saying alternative histories rather than even alternatives to history as ways of thinking about past. And oh, again, my encouragement is oh, do, the, do the work, oh, but pay attention to that which exceeds the context oh, of this particular text and to be able to connect them to things that are very, very much resonant with the questions that you're asking and the people that you're talking about and the spaces that you're engaging. Um, bueno, yo al respecto creo que justo. In eh, this respect, I think. Eh, eh, como que de eso iba un poco mi presentación, ¿no? That's me, what my presentation was about. Me parece que ten, tenemos que identificar quién utiliza los conceptos, we ¿no? Have to en, que, en qué discurso se utiliza. En qué discurso. ¿Cuál justo como cuál es el origen? What is the origin? Entonces pienso que. Eh, I think. En, bueno, en ese sentido creo que. Sense, es muy fácil lo que les decía hace rato también de la interseccionalidad, o sea, el hecho de, por earlier, ejemplo, a veces las personas utilizan esos conceptos que está bien para, para identificar, concepts, okay eh, ¿no? como de forma muy categórica, muy in académica, pero que en, ya en, la, en, en, la, en una forma tangible identificar in a, in en qué discursos form, y cuáles son las instituciones que utilizan ¿no? como los conceptos. What institutions are used as, within the concept. Entonces, bueno, eso es lo que quiero decir al respecto. That's all I want to say. Um, great. Uh, I have a question. Um, this is specifically for Samson um, from Cyprian Kambili. 
Um, he's asking, what is the role of African philosophy in post-colonial epistemic resistance for African social theory? I just noticed how oxymoronic the concepts sound together in the question sound. Uh, I'll, I'll respond to that one very quickly. Yeah, and uh, uh, given uh, the, that there's all, already the capture, yeah, so that there's already something oxymoronic in the question. Um, my own preference yeah, is before even starting to articulate questions of African philosophy, uh, to pay attention to modes of thought yeah, and systems of thought that some of them exist within the philosophical fold and a lot of them exceed philosophy and are even counter the very uh, assumption or presuppositions that one might take as philosophical. And in the post-colonial context, you have got these ways of knowing existing side by side, you'll always find uh, a big debate um, that has been raging for, for many years. Is there such a thing as African philosophy? You know, people like well, Mudimbe, you know, again, who are engaged, going into the very inventedness of the, uh, of the notion of Africa. Yeah? How has Africa itself been invented? But to be able to use this as not as a way of um, you know, trying to illustrate yeah, that we too have a philosophy, well, but to open up and look at the multiple modes of thought uh, and to be able to see how they work in the societies, the way they, um, you, you, ch you challenge some of the designations yeah, that this is ethno philosophy. Yeah, as if philosophy is from uh, the West and not in and of themselves an ethno philosophy. Uh, so to be able to do, uh, again, as I'd say, uh, my own interest has been to think of different modes of thought. Uh, some of them, well, uh, actually being philosophical and a lot of them exceeding. So when you ask, what is it relevant to um, the post-colonial epistemic resistance? It's, it's, it's important, yeah. Uh, African philosophy, those who actually articulate African philosophy have done considerable work to challenge the colonial forms of knowledge, yeah? That is given. Yeah? And you'll see this, uh, whether it's a professional philosophers who've done this or people who are doing the kind of social political thought yeah? through African socialism and other ways of thinking about African societies. Uh, but one cannot limit themselves, this, themselves to the philosophical project. An overinvestment in philosophy uh, actually limits the possibility of encountering the multiplicity of thought in any given, given society. So the philosopher becomes the only person who represents and actually uh, um, in, 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 a, in a sense confiscates the voice and dominates the domain of thought of a, of a society. Can I add, following on from uh, what Samson said, and uh, again, um, absolutely, and I think this is extra work, but it is part of decolon you know, decolonizing. So, um, and citation is important, but again, it's who do you cite, right? And um, since a lot of decolonial work goes hand in hand with unlearning and literally it's a journey of discovering local you know indigenous uh, voices and it's about um, yeah finding these sources right and including them in our uh, in our work instead of um, you know the more famous you know uh, academic uh, that happened to be published in a big uh, journal so yeah, and this I think links back to the question that was asked before, the the different definitions and um, you know yes you want to show your homework but I think um, you I think it there is room you know to include the counter uh, counter narratives and this would include uh, uh, willfully you know citing people from uh, the region and by people I mean philosophers, academics, 
activists, especially activists and, uh, you know, uh, personal uh, narratives. Um, and chances are you are going to find these sources in very uh, volatile, you know, situations, a painting, a graffiti, a history, anecdotally. So it's a different way of archiving altogether. And yeah, to, to also follow on from uh, what Samson said. So yes, it's an alternative to history, but it's also um, very recently, as you know, knows, we had a lesson on development. And for example, if we look at uh, decolonial scholars from South America, we have really an emerging uh, trend, right, of alternative to development in itself, like this whole discourse of uh, development. Um, yeah, next week we do one, for example, Pachamama, right? We are looking at who appropriated this uh, notion? Why did it become such a liberal, trendy, hipstery, uh, vegan -y, uh, I'm better than you, I'm greener than you kind of concept? And uh, yeah, what does it mean, you know, in terms of development when we think about the coffee industry, um, the terrible state really of uh, the, the, the coffee, uh, uh, um, growing coffee beans industry in, in South America. So, yeah. And um, it's usually bleak. And uh, in the word of Sarah Ahmed, uh, just like, you know, feminists are killjoys. A lot of decolonial work also brings with it its share of being a killjoy because nothing, nothing will ever <laughs> look the same again. And because you are constantly historicizing, you're like, oh my God, you know, like, how did it come to this? What is, how did we allow things, right, to get this uh, bad? But it, this is exactly also what makes it very hopeful, right, very optimistic, because you're like, okay, you know, I can do some writing, I can do some work and, um, hopefully, yeah, provide something again. Is it counter? Is it speaking against? Is it uh, erasing? Is it refashioning? Et cetera. Et cetera. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, I think um, the next question is, again, a general one, but I'll, I'll ask um, Esmeralda to um, reply first, please. And it says, what strategies can we draw upon to be individually and collectively vigilant that the new wave of interest, this new wave of interest in decolonizing does not recolonize and cause more harm extracting knowledge to reinforce hegemony? Sí, me, lo que pienso que es muy importante y que es una estrategia de nuestra colectiva What I think is really important and is, in, is a strategy of our collective es eh, te, tener en cuenta quién es la persona que, nos, que se quiere acercar a nosotras para investigar nuestra experiencia It's uh, having in mind who is like coming to us to, to be part of our experience eh, Porque justamente hay muchas investigadoras eh, con postdoctorados y because eh, there's a lot of investigators with like post doctorates eh, que, que, que nos escriben para de, apelar us. un poco incluso a, a nuestra sororidad. To appeal to our sorority. Eh, y, y que les demos como pues, la información de nuestro trabajo, de, de nuestra organización. And they ask us to give them the, the information of the, about our work and our, uh, and our labor. Y, no, y nosotros intentamos primero generar un diálogo. And we first try to create a dialogue. Eh, para conocer un poco más de la trayectoria del trabajo de la compañera. To understand the trajectory of like the, of our comrades or our, our fellows uh, uh, work. Sus posturas, eh, bueno, en ese diálogo incluimos una discusión sobre their temas postures. y posturas políticas. And in that dialogue talk about their postures and political themes. Y eventualmente eh, algo que nosotras tenemos muy claro es eh, la noción del apoyo mutuo. Eventually, something that we have very clear is the notion of uh, mutually. Eh, y en ese sentido, nosotras sí pedimos que eh, ellas también formen parte de alguna actividad con nosotras. In that sense, we ask that they be a part. We ask that they be part of an activity with us. 
o podamos desarrollar en conjunto algún eh, proyecto como un taller. Eh. And that we develop a, a project together, like some sort of, uh, uh, I don't know the word for that yet. <laughs> like a workshop, sorry. Eh, y pienso que eso al menos hace que las personas se involucren en nuestro trabajo y en los espacios donde trabajamos. That, uh, that causes people to be involved in our work and our spaces, in the spaces where we work. Eh, y entiendo que siempre vamos a estar expuestas, expuestes a, a riesgos eh, que tengan que ver con información quizás un poco más delicada. Uh, we know that we will we'll always be exposed to information uh, to be, to, when we're working with information, it's a little bit more delicate, right? Ajá, pero me, me parece que ahí hemos elegido entre dos estrategias que elige generalmente la gente que trabaja en temas, por ejemplo, de activismo. We've uh, chosen between two strat strategies that are usually used by people that are involved in hacktivism. Que es la visibilidad absoluta o el anonimato. Which is absolute visibility or anonymity. Y eh, nosotras el, eh, hemos elegido visibilizar nuestro trabajo y visibilizarnos a nosotras y nombrarnos en los espacios. So we've chosen to be visible, uh, be, be visible in the spaces and like be named and recognized in order to... Como, como una forma nada más de, de, de hacernos presentes en un contexto en México que es de, su, de censura total, desaparición de activistas. Mm -hmm. This is, this is uh, to make ourselves present in a context in Mexico which, which involves uh, state repression, uh, uh, like, like state sanctioned murder, uh, a lot of like violence that is directed at activists. Pero sabemos que el riesgo es, eh, o sea, no hay forma de que no, no nos arriesguemos nosotras y tampoco eh, hay forma de evitar que eventualmente se utilicen ciertas estrategias para cooptar los discursos que utilizamos. Yeah. So we realize that this is a risk uh, and that we, we like, it's, an, it's the nature of, like, the work. Uh, but also that we realize that there, it's the nature of the work that our work will be uh, co-opted by... Uh, like uh, intellectual hegemony, the intellectual hegemony, intellectual. No? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. y, y, y lo único, o sea, ya como para acabar, lo único que, que nos mm -hmm. queda es reiterar mucho nuestra postura desde la radicalidad, ¿no? Desde el anticapitalismo, desde la decolonialidad y desde la despatriarcalización. To finish, all we have left is to like reinforce and revindicate our position or our posture, which is uh, decolonization, uh, anti. Uh, eh, patriarchy and uh, anti-colonization and, and anti-capitalism. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Um, I think Shubanshu wanted to say one or two words here before um, we go to the next speakers to answer the question. Shubanshu? Yeah, I mean, in terms of appropriation, and I thought, you know, I should also add this uh, point, that appropriation is something that uh, is not, it's not something that can come only from, you know, uh, something that is emanating from the West. It can also come from the global South. And what I have in mind here is the Subaltern Studies Collective. Uh, you know, a collective uh, that is emanating from global South, from South Asian scholars, but occupied by upper caste Bengali men. It is only later, you know, uh, there are some Muslims, some uh, women, uh, or even when they were women, they were all upper caste women. Gayatri Spivak Chakravarti is an upper caste woman. Uh, so, and despite the fact that it is a study uh, that is coming from Global South, it does not take into account the category of caste, the category of Dalit, the broken man, who is the most marginalized uh, category. So it sort of, uh, 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 attaches itself to the uh, category of class and class alone, but not uh, uh, the Dalit man or the Dalit woman who is the most marginalized in that context. So it, it, it was a scholarship occupied by the Chakravartis, by uh, Guhas and by, you know, other upper caste Bengali intellectuals. So appropriation is something that can come from the global south uh, uh, as well. Yeah, that's a limited point I wanted to add. Right, thank you. Um, okay, so um, aware that time is going on very quickly. Molly has one question um, for the speakers and then I think we hand over to Angeline to break us into groups. 
Yes, it's, um, we've had loads of really great questions and I'm so sorry that we haven't had time to represent everybody's views in the discussion today. Um, this question was from Deborah Bruce. Um, it was it was asked of Sophia, but I think it's actually really relevant to, to the whole kind of richness of the panel discussion today. Um, she would love to know more about uh, the conceptual and practical issues and exhaustion, she adds, of working on and across different borders all at the same time on the epistemic cracks in attempting to translate across languages and positionalities. So I don't know who would like to take that one first. Maybe Sabiha, because it was aimed um, specifically at you. <laughs> it is a great uh, question. And um, so I can tell you a very recent experience, not personal, but my very close uh, colleague working on Iranian context. So when COVID happened, all these journalists were like, yeah, send us you know, your feminist reflections about uh, COVID. Uh, you know, how do we think about the pandemic from feminist lens? So my friend sent uh, uh, her piece, right? And it was a blog. It wasn't going to be peer refereed. It was in just a blog, you know, send us your 1500 words and we can um, uh, publish them. And literally, the editors from two distinct journals told her, oh, this is too specific, you know, you need another 1500 words just to um, introduce the reader to your context. Right, so we have all these blogs, of course, written by Western based, very privileged uh, scholars. And um, not that I want to be horrible, but oftentimes when we think about Western paradigms, the argument is predictable and you know where it's going to lead to. And um, it doesn't, you know, I, I personally find it, it doesn't uh, arouse all my senses, let's say, right? Because, um, yeah, these are the strict frameworks, right? That uh, we are so conditioned to work within. And so it uh, goes. But uh, to answer the question, the, you know, the frustrations is, I am learning to say no a lot. So, um, I, I've lost count of how many emails. Hello, can you put us in contact with activists and people from the region? No, I am not going to put you in contact with activists and uh, specialists from the region. You go and do your homework. In my question and A, you know, after talks, I keep my answers very sharp. I am not going to teach you, you know, uh, how to do decolonial work. Leave the discipline, go and research something else. I am not going to give you, you know, my, uh, my tools. And um, why do I feel confident about it? Because in general, I feel confident about it. You know, I'm surrounded by uh, peers. I am surrounded by uh, students, you know, by spaces like this. And I know there is room, you know, to make uh, this knowledge uh, come across. It takes a longer, uh, you know, it's, a, it takes, it's not a shortcut, but uh, it is what it is. But it's also the same, right? Um, if I want to speak to activists from the region and if they said, tell me, leave me alone, I understand it. I totally understand it. And I don't argue with them. And th it is their right to say no. And when I get sent articles to review, if the author is not reflecting on their positionality, I don't want anything to do with their work. I don't want to. You know, one of the worst things I ever read it was a great piece, you know, perfectly written academically and scientifically speaking about uh, same sex uh, in uh, a South African setting. The author mentions apartheid once, no mention of race, no mention of blackness. How do you get away with writing a paper on gay sex in an African context in South Africa and not mention race and blackness, you know, and so, of course, I sent my big uh, litany of complaints uh, to borrow from Makaria, from uh, Kenya, to the authors, to the editors. And yeah, they did dismiss me with one line. Thank you for your reflections. And just say no, just say no, you know, this is uh, the place that you have and uh, you need to say no because it's a lot of work and you need to find, you know, your, you need to invest and prioritize. And you will know where to invest and where to prioritize. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Can I add a few remarks? Yeah. Uh, 
just adding one or two things to what Sabia said um, is that the act of refusal is an extremely important one, uh, uh, but it also comes from a recognition of power, asymmetrical power relations. Uh, and what that often means is that uh, you could be in the academy, yeah, but you occupy a marginal position. Uh, and that marginal position isn't necessarily a professional position, but uh, it becomes uh, a position of knowledge uh, such that you are tasked with uh, educating and re-educating. Uh, you're tasked with uh, a kind of sanitization of the conscience uh, of uh, the colonizing subject of colleagues. Uh, I joke about it you know, in a very serious way that your work sometimes becomes that of moving from cleaning the house and working in the field to actually cleaning people's conscience yeah and those that's the kind of labor that one must refuse to do uh, it has to be uh, seeking mutuality seeking conversation rather than uh, uh, rather, rather than conversion, yeah, you get to turn together, yeah, rather than you are turned into uh, a commodity. Because sometimes, uh, to be enamored, to be awarded and rewarded, uh, whether it's with the fellowships, it's the positions and everything, is sometimes the price of or the, what one gets by being co-opted in certain ways. So be suspicious of the recognition, yeah. When you're recognized, sometimes it means you make perfect sense and you have to ask, what is the condition of possibility of you making perfect sense within a regime that is predicated on these kinds of hierarchies? So uh, to, always, uh, uh, to, to, to always have a kind of ethic of suspicion, but generosity at the same time. Yeah? You can be able to relate not only with people who look like you, yeah, who think like you, and as Subran puts it quite well, yeah, you get to realize very quickly that oh, there might be mutualities, there might be resonances oh, with people across national boundaries, across the geographical boundaries that sometimes oh, are much more meaningful than those of the people who you occupy the same lived space with and class is a good uh, indication indication of this you could be from the same city yeah but the hierarchies of class means that if you're you're writing against capital someone who's engaging in the same kind of project from a different region of the world is actually a much much more uh, resonant and meaningful kind of sodality yeah not only solidarity but to be able to create these sodalities that are meaningful because of the projects that we are actually participating in. Angeline, I was just uh, thinking Gajendran has just finally joined, should we? Uh... Uh, have him speak for a short while and then break it. Yeah, so which okay. means the, the plan was at this time to go into breakout groups and have some time for a more fluid discussion in smaller groups. But, uh, you know, Gajendran has a presentation he has prepared. Um, and we have had plenty of time for discussion of the first three presentations. I think we should, we'd all like to hear what, what he has to share with us. Would you like to introduce him, Shibranshu? As Gajendran, are you are you ready to present? Yes, I am. Brilliant. <laughs> really apologies, yeah. Gajendra, we actually introduced you uh, in the beginning of the session because we didn't know that you were not there. So everybody is aware <laughs> of your work. So you know, just to uh, Save time, maybe we should listen uh, from you directly. Exactly. Um, 
really apologies. There was a massive uh, internet breakdown here uh, in our university, and I think I also got caught in that and was on phone. And finally, I mean, okay. So um, uh, quickly wanted to uh, maybe within ten minutes. Uh, do you think I can uh, upload my PowerPoint? Uh, Maybe because as of now I'm disabled, or I can just. You can share your screen um, if you want to email it to me, but that might take a few seconds. I'll, yeah. I'll open yeah. it up when it when it gets here. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me make you co-host, then you can share share yeah, the screen. Please do. please do. Yeah. Okay, you should be able to share your screen now if you wish to. Right now, yes. Uh, is it popping up? Yeah. Good. Uh, are you able to see all of you? Yeah. Yeah, we can all see it clearly. And now I'll. Um, if you use, um, yeah, perfect. Good. Um, so uh, I'll just quickly time it within uh, um, ten minutes or so. I'll see. So um, um, I'm. I'm uh, um, Close this. Yeah. Um, for some reason. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. So um, uh, probably um, you know of my other colleagues, uh, you know Samson and, and um, uh, others would have explained this in detail. But what I had quick thought was regarding epistemological pluralism and rational solidarities. I think we need to have a, a quick break of the divide, you know, what colonialism did in many parts of the world. Um, so um, right now, as, as, a, as a student and an academic of social sciences and humanities, what I found is uh, clearly we have epistemological pluralism before, before Western colonialism in many parts of the world. Um, but you know, with the colonialism, what happens is there are, there are claims about universalism, which is basically Western centered, uh, you know, white, uh, West and uh, centered Anglo uh, uh, male world is centralized. So we have this pre-colonial um, exchange of ideas from different parts of the world, I guess, which needs to be researched more upon. And then we have the post-colonial situation. But what I find through my research is that clearly uh, what was projected as humanism is basically a liberal humanism in which, as I said, a, a white uh, West uh, Anglo male is, is uh, fixed as, as the core of the whole discourse. Um, so as I say, the Western uh, uh, predominance of knowledge production happens in the moment. We have Kant, Hegel, and a whole lot of them um, uh, thereafter. And then the most important element is this kind of legitimization of uh, 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 white Anglo West, uh, you know, centrality wouldn't have happened, but for the non-Western collaborator, which I think probably Shubhran Shah would have touched and uh, when he talked about the subaltern perspective. So there are non-Western collaborators about which we don't know. Um, how, how these Western epistemologies and institutions got legitimized. Here I intervene as a South Asianist. Um, so for example, we, we know through post-colonial school, um, the atrocities of colonialism, and it's been 70 years of India's Republic, but yet we are not able to get out of this old colonial structures. Uh, and, and the collaborators, local collaborators, we are yet to uh, get to know in detail. Um, so uh, therefore I call it as a sort of a colonialist casteist continuum. We have the problem of caste in South Asia as races in other parts of the world. Um, so the local collaborators also legitimized casteism. So the colonialism and casteism come together to marginalize a large majority of Indians and South Asians, uh, irrespective of the religion and so on. So that's one set of ideas. The other is, of course, we have the resistance of the oppressed in the West and elsewhere. Uh, we need to know more about it. We are beginning to un unravel, like again, Shupran Shu pointed out about subaltern school. Subaltern school in South Asia has largely failed and they've closed the shop already. So we don't know much about the organic intellectuals and so on. Some of us are beginning to touch. And by the way, there were transnational intersectional solidarities from South Asia, even 1900s, um, which I'll quickly show. So, um, so that way, uh, probably there is this epistemological pluralism should be understood from the point of view of oppressed. Now, this is one of the things I had you know, quickly to show how 
this uh, the underground railroad of the US, you know, which was uh, basically a space, safe space for African Americans to escape into Canada. So there were Indians sitting in Tamil Nadu, where I come from in South India, who were supportive of this movement, the underground underground railroad, way, way back in the 1900s, early 1900s. So so people knew those days there was no internet and all that, but still. So that kind of a, so there was clearly an exchange and understanding. People were appreciating the oppressed African-Americans escaping and so on. So this one. So knowledge production and barriers, you know, I have something to, some of you would have discussed. The predominance of English is, 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 um, is, is really uh, continuing. Uh, and then, so there are, you know, we encourage people to go field work. And so we go, we send our students and researchers, they understand the locals and master them and temporarily their language and so on, but keeping them as they are. This is what I tragically find in South Asia. So many Western intellectuals have gone and studied my own, some of my professors at Columbia University, New York, where I did my PhD, I asked them, have they ever gone back to the field work? Many of them said, no, field work area, I mean in India. So that's a tragedy. So in a way I find, um, uh, you know, um, the, the local situation is maintained and, 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 and the Western Academy is largely happy about the periphery being as periphery uh, 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 as it is. Um, and we have the letter writers and reviewers, editors, again, in the Western world, I come across largely this kind of a very condescending attitude in, in, in the academic institutions. Um, so South Asian studies, for instance, are largely controlled by, uh, you know, in, in the US, for instance, you know, uh, white folks, and there are not many, and there are not, not African-Americans, there are no uh, South Americans, uh, or some collaborators from India who are again privileged. In contrast, I talk about vernacular archives, about which we don't know much. South Asia is a land of multiple languages. I'm not talking about dialects, languages. So, but we are yet to really bring in the organic intellectuals, um, you know, uh, to speak about them, their own perspectives and theories and standpoints. So, and they are embedded in our vernacular archives, not in English archives. So, so that's what I'm saying. You know, there are a lot of folks who talk about Foucault to, you know, Agamben and uh, Judith Butler and so on. But unfortunately, there is just a tokenism. These ideas are not radically understood and applied in the South Asian context. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and then um, two, very quickly, two things. How do we decolonize our research? Um, say, for example, in my field, South Asian studies. Two things I point out. One is, you know, dislodging, dislodging the dominant paradigms, you know? So uh, that, is, that has got to happen, the persons. That's why I refer to very consciously white folks. Why not African-American folks uh, and South American folks go to study South Asian, South Asian, um, cultures and religions and so on. So, so that way we need to interrogate the uh, uh, legitimized dominant perspective on South Asia. Take for example, Hinduism. Everybody, if I ask you, immediately would say, oh, South Asia is a land of Hinduism, which is not the case. We have Islam from 711, Muhammad Ibn's Islam in the seventh century we know, but from 711 common era, we have Muslims in India and Christians are there from the first century uh, common era. So, so it's a land of multiple religions, but as of now from, and this very word Hinduism is not even two, you know, 200 year old uh, term. And so, so that way, this is, these things have to be exposed. And within this Hinduism, we have clearly privileged caste groups who are minorities in India benefit. So this one said, this logic. Engaging is another thing which I'm very much interested in. That's what I'm trying to do. Uh, in understanding the epistemologies of the oppressed. What are, what, how do we engage? The positive cultural aspects. We know oppressed groups, majority of Indians are oppressed in the name of caste and religion. But have we ever cared to unravel their epistemologies in their own terms, for their own sake? So we have a long way to go in understanding that. Um, so uh, positive subjectivity, their positive subjectivity, they are oppressed, we understand, but they have positive subjectivity, positive identity, and, and their own cultures. And so their own organic intellectuals. Um, so these have to be unraveled. And two important things which I, I would like to point out here is not just the discursive aspects, their own conceptual standpoint, their own ideas, that's one set. But their, their ideas are embedded in non-discursive traditions, knowledge traditions. 
it could be music it could be medicine a variety of things we are able to unravel and they are of course intersectionalities interconnections and race caste gender question okay so and then um, very quickly what is decolonizing praxis and alongside and outside so in theory clearly as i say the vernacular voices have to be encouraged brought in given centrality uh, more than the english archives and 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 english based material research and so on and also i said discussive non um, um, non discussive practices have to be integrated and bringing organic intellectuals in our practice in in our class um that's very very important uh, uh, we talk and you know it's the marginalized folks don't uh, come in as students or intellectuals in our own class it's the high time we need, we need to do it and some of the things that uh, in the other side that i show is that living with the community we need to really encourage our undergraduate and 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 our master students to go and do field work a lot more by living with them i tried this by taking my german students to india uh, and taking them to uh, you know um, farms and 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 um, um, slums and so on and they came back and wrote very powerful theses and they went they are going back again they are producing films they are living with them so that way i think training our undergrads to live with the communities is extremely uh, important and of course this research should be shared with those communities it's not happening right now like i said professors and phd students come back from south asia and retain and the, the knowledge doesn't go back to those communities the sharing is important and enabling transformation um, of those communities yeah, you know as they would as per their plans this is very important otherwise we want the dalits to be dalits and Uh, marginalized to be marginalized so that we can continue to do our field work our work is this is a major point that we need to address and of course the local global networks have to be encouraged people are doing it is high time and we need to for their own um, uh, emancipation and the support is needed as more and more um say for example in in india hindu right wing groups come into being this global local network is extremely important for marginalized voices to come about Okay, so that's all I have. Um, sorry um, for the delays, and um, maybe I, I could have had shared more had I uh, been uh, uh, in time without these technical problems. Apologies again. So looking forward to hear more from you. Thanks. So yeah, I think you know we do not have enough time to uh, for breakout rooms. Perhaps we can take more questions and uh, you know uh, conclude here itself. Ziva and Molly, do we have more questions that we can discuss? Angeline, is that is that all right? Um, yes, I, I think that's fine. Perhaps um, I there haven't been a lot of comments and questions that have come up. So is it? is there anyone who wants to put up their hand to um add a comment or uh pose a question for gendron i have a question go ahead elaine yeah please go ahead yeah you're muted Sorry, it's very early in the morning here, but I'm amongst friends, so my hair can be standing on end. Um, what I, my question to everyone is the language that's being used. These are like really big words that exclude. And I, I was a graduate rep on a hiring committee and somebody with a lot of power said to their assistant, when you get your master's degree you will know what epistemology means i was horrified can i just i think you know what i'm asking so i'm just going to it, it just the classism i'm trying to deal with poverty discrimination in canada and we don't want to have that conversation we're a colonized nation Yeah, Gendron, you talked about language in terms of languages. Maybe you have a, a response 
Sure. So, um, um, thank you for that question, Lynn. And I think um, I I understand it in a, in a couple of ways. Um, um, uh, epistemology, yes. Um, uh, it is as far as India is concerned. I come from the South Asian grassroots uh, uh, level perspective. Um, it is very tragic to know the, the Indian Academy, as well as the South Asian Studies, for instance, um, two two kinds of uh, linguistic, uh, you know, do, sort of domination happens. One is, of course, like I said, English. Um, um, almost, I think, eighty percent or a eighty-five percent of Indians uh, wouldn't be able to comfortably converse and write and speak and so on. All of us go through English classes at some point. So you are absolutely right. And, and so even some of the basic terms we are not clear about, um, be it undergrad student or master student. And then concepts like epistemology, maybe uh, one or two universities in, in, in India would really break it down to help people to understand critically about their own um, epistemological crisis and, and the transformation they need. That's one set, so English. And then within India, India itself, we have, you know, it's a land of multiple languages and, um, um, and clearly Hindi is more prioritized, especially in North India. Um, so multiple other regional languages are not given um, serious importance. So um, that's one side. And the third element would be these languages, many of the folks from within say the language I speak is called Tamil. Uh, and so there are many odd and classical language and it's been there for 3000 years and so on, recorded history. But pe people are not able to really work this language, uh, Tamil language for their own emancipatory politics and, um, uh, and so on. So there's a, there are a lot of Tamils across the world now in Canada, in the US, in different parts of the Europe, but not many really put together. We don't even have a full-fledged engineering course in Tamil full-fledged medicine course in Tamil. So on the one hand, we claim ancient classical language status. On the other hand, it is not pushed to um, talk about their own um, practical and everyday life as well as uh, philosophical aspects in a big way. And so these are some of the challenges um, uh, in the non-English speaking world, where on the one hand, we have strangely classical languages, which are really, really many centuries older than English as we speak. Um, yet they are not able to really centralize their perspective for their own emancipatory uh, politics and, and, and practices. These are some of my thoughts. Can I just ask another question of you then? So I just had a job interview with the university okay. and, and it's between a university and a city. And I don't talk like an academic because I've never mastered that language. Uh, I come from generational poverty and I suppose I've chosen to not try to assimilate. And I don't want to assimilate. Is this bad? Um, I was just reading this morning about uh, assimilation and, um, uh, you know, Mario Nyang's work and, um, so I completely agree. Um, this is the kind of thing that I would say for, as an Indian. Um, uh, so I, I come from South India, as I said, I, I speak Tamil language. So, and I lived in North India for long, for example, Shubran Shu and me, we graduated from the same university. And I taught in the university called Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. So I lived for long to understand, um, but I clearly see the different regional divisions and hierarchies operating. So in this situation, um, I, you know, I've said in some of the faculty meetings in Delhi, I was one of the you know, dark skin, probably the only dark skin guy sitting in the faculty room, right? So, so I clearly understand. So uh, there is some alienation. There is just no real genuine um, uh, consideration for my own identity, culture, and, res and the language, um, respect for the language and so on. So um, assimilation, definitely is a problem. And probably like you said, I don't want to be assimilated. And, and I would like to speak about my own positive identity. It doesn't mean I want to be an essentialist, an exclusivist as the dominant discourses are. 
So um, I, I want me to be respected as I am, like I would like uh, others uh, to be as they are. But if there is domination, I would like to interrogate. If there is a problem of casteism, I would like to interrogate. There is, if there is a problem of racism, I would like to interrogate. If there is a problem of gender discrimination, I would like to interrogate. And that is self-interrogation uh, includes. And so, so I, I completely agree. You don't have to, but I, I think definitely um, um, you hold on to something positive, which others have to take seriously. And they don't have to really force you to uh, pick up a particular language. As it happened in the 1920s, North America. So Native Americans were forced to, they were uprooted in North America to go and learn English. And 1930s, they reversed the politic, uh, policies. 1950s um, in the US, they changed again, uh, forcing assimilation. And we know about Australia, what, uh, you know, how, how many generations of Aborigines were ruined. And, and now they are being looked down upon as alcoholics and drug addicts and so on. So I fully understand what do you mean. Um, so there is a clear uh, race-based assimilation goes on many parts of the world, which, for, which we don't have to take seriously, even as we hold on to our own positive identity. And in, in South Asia, you have a domination and forced assimilation goes on the level of language and caste and so on. Um, um, so which, we, which have to be resisted uh, by the diverse uh, linguistic communities with their own positive identities. And, and like I said in my slide, positive identities, uh, cultures, and so on. Thank you, Elaine. I hope I make sense. I'm not fully really sure. Thank you. Okay, can I add something, please? Oh, okay. Elaine, I'd put your question uh, slightly differently uh, based on uh, thinking from the position that you're articulating. And it's to be able to ask um, or even to uh, assert that no class, race uh, has got monopoly over thought, yeah, over complexity of ideas, over the beauty of language. Uh, and when one thinks, for instance, that uh, to think or to speak in a certain way is automatically an assimilation yeah, into, 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 a, into an academic class yeah, or that to be able to articulate concepts that are necessary sometimes to speak about an experience is, an, um, is kind of selling out. Yeah? There are multiple things going, going on. Yeah? It's first and foremost to be able to disentangle this notion that people of a certain class or people within certain institutions have monopoly over knowledge, intelligence, and thought. Uh, I've grown up in Nairobi, you know, went to school there, and some of the most articulate, and I'll use the word articulate here, uh, and complex ideas that you know, still inform the way I think about the world and figure you know, what I'm doing with diplomacy within the academy and beyond, uh, is not from academics, yeah? Is not from people working within the university, yeah? It's artists, friends. It's people who well, have grown up with sitting in the base, listening to reggae music, yeah? Th those were the first kinds of, you'd say, consciousness raising you know, spaces. You know? And when we start thinking that um, it's when one comes to the university, that thought begins when one gets a position and one becomes published. Well, that in and of itself is a myth. So we need to debunk that particular myth. And part of even the decolonizing of knowledge is that act of refusing. Yeah? Gugu Adiongo puts it quite well when he talks about what he, he calls poor theory. Yeah? And he says that uh, we need to dissociate, for instance, yeah? the density, the, the, this connection that people assume that the density of words is equals to the density of thought. Yeah, you could be, you know, you could have someone who it's concept after concept after concept, but what exactly are they saying? That's the first thing. But at the same time, you know, to be able to recognize, acknowledge and make connections and be in conversation with people who are thinking the same 
things or even different things than you are from multi from multiple multiple spaces. You know? The act of cooptation often comes when you know, one thinks that you know, this is the way the academy must speak. Yeah, that when you enter it, you must give up everything that you are in order to assimilate and in order to be intelligible. Yeah, rather than asking where does that regime of intelligibility come from? Yeah, what does it produce? Who does it silence and who does it privilege? So that act of pluralizing, decolonizing, though, is not only uh, participating in disciplinary uh, kinds of codes, you have to be indisciplined often, yeah, or even transdisciplinary in order to be able to do the kind of work that you're doing. So it's actually the more basic question becomes a useful one, which is to ask, what is the language, which skills, which kind of associations, which aesthetic yeah, is adequate to the kind of work that you'd like to do and for whom? Thank you so much for that. So I have one last question, um, which um, relates to um, Sabiha's point and uh, Samson's as well about the incessant requirements um, that PhD students face to justify non-Western epistemologies against Western ones. And it also links to another question which asks, how can we start decolonizing the work within governmental institutions that are based on academic Western approaches? So the the, the struggle between um, trying to justify um, our own non-Western epistemologies against the Western ones. Sabiha? I heard the word uh, government and uh, I went through, <laughs> you know, a, a brain freeze. Well, it is a very difficult question. But I also, this, this backlash, right, that we are see, seeing. So all of us here are um, somewhat, um, I mean, they haven't exactly termed us, right, as the terrorists, but clearly we know, right, that critical race theory has become a thing. It has made its way into, into Congress, into Parliament. There's a mega backlash against gender studies, uh, be it in Eastern Europe, uh, or in South America, especially in Brazil, um, but even in UK universities. And, um, right, and a lot of it has to do with this, again, this white masculinity being in crisis. And this links directly to what Elaine said. Um, unfortunately, we live in an era that um, uh, posits, right, class uh, against race in terms of uh, non-privilege and privilege, etc. So yes, decolonial work is also about um, recognizing, right, the workings of, uh, you know, capitalism, neoliberalism, um, and all these different uh, economic um, structures that directly, directly have a direct impact, right, on how we uh, live our lives. And the backlash is good because it shows that we are doing something right. Right, and whatever it is that we are thinking about, there's a clearly a direct threat uh, to the status quo. How do we decolonize in uh, governmental institutions? Can we? Um, I think today we are paying the price of institutionalized uh, diversity, of vertical diversity. And I think we would all agree that it's the biggest joke that was ever told. Oh, I can't speak about race because I don't want to be accused of racism. But what has it led to today? You know, uh, you cannot have a white pundit uh, talking about football on UK television because of diversity, right? I mean, in the UK, it's really bleak uh, what you see. And everybody needs learning and educating, like, um, you know, your lay reader, but also your, uh, you know, I received feedback late yesterday, literally for a piece I wrote and I almost forgot myself in the piece and the reviewers were like, can you please remember that you are decolonizing? Can you center, you know, my, your context 
I became totally lost, you know, in the theoretical labyrinth. And it's an ongoing work. And I don't know where it ends and I don't know where it starts. And I think we have only barely touched the surface. If you think about uh, France today, so the whole concept of intersectionality made it to France literally five minutes ago in the grand scheme of things. And you already have this uh, very, very angry white anxiety. Oh my God, racism in reverse. You know, we are the people uh, under threat now. And like, come on, you know, and, but yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't have an answer, but it clearly shows, right? You need to step out of your discipline. It is interdisciplinary, like Samson said, it is transdisciplinary like Samson said, and vertical diversity, just to answer Elaine's question very much, it's, you know, when the state tells you, um, you know, it's basically an approach of add and stir, tokenism, right? Uh, add a few women, add a few people of color and, um, you know, and when you do that, basically what you are telling people is that, oh, we have race on the one hand side, but you are also not acknowledging your failures as a state to look after the poor classes, you know, the poor uh, uh, populations, regardless of whether they're uh, white or uh, black or in between. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of, uh, I have a lot of uh, problems with it. And today we are seeing the price of it, right? When very big names tell you that the most destitute student in the university is the white male uh, from working class. Why are you comparing, you know? We should acknowledge that we have a problem with the white young male working class student in as much as, you know, the underprivileged black student. You don't get to say either or, or place these oppressions on a hierarchy because there is not one that is worse or more than the other. And they are interlinked and we know they are because when we do our historical analysis, we find that capitalism co-produces racism and vice versa. I'll leave it here because I, I can see it's already four o'clock. Thank you. Helen, should we take closing remarks from Esmilarda, uh, uh, Samson, Katendran, if do you want to add something? I wanted to add something to, to what was just commented. Eh, bueno, primero, eh, First pensar thing. que justo son o, o parte o lo que entendemos nosotros como parte de procesos de descolonización. Um, uh, adding that uh, what we consider processes of decolonization. También es pensar, eh, is also e imaginar to, y reinventar. It's also to think, imagine and reinvent. Eh, otras, otras formas de, de producción de conocimiento. Other forms of producing knowledge. Eh, acercarnos y, y comprender eh, el, el, las formas de conocimiento justo de comunidades indígenas. Coming close to and trying to understand the forms of uh, information and creating information of indigenous communities. Uh -huh. Populares, urbanas y un poco lo que les comentaba. Popular también. urban communities, as in the working poor. Porque pienso que, eh, aunque quizás pensamos que hay un ejercicio de producción de conocimiento masivo. Although we think that there is an exercise in creating, uh, was it mass information? Se sigue creando desde los mismos lugares, con las mismas intenciones, las mismas estructuras. It's still being created from the same place, with the, from the same places, with the same structures. Y retomando justo lo último que decían, creo que eh, es importante construir formas de resistencia que no son las resistencias que ellos esperan, por ejemplo, it's disputar important, los espacios. It's important to create forms of resistance that they are not prepared for. Uh, and by that, she means like institutions and like uh, the, what's it, la hegemonía cultural, la, the cultural hegemony by taking control of spaces, tomar espacios. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Y, por ejemplo, me hacía sentido lo que comentaban también sobre el paternalismo y los gobiernos en América Latina. I think uh, there's something to be said about paternalism and governments in Latin America. A, a nosotras nos gusta mucho la lectura de Iván Illich y el tema que, de la desescolarización. We very much like uh, the writing of uh, Iván Illich and the, the concept of uh, descolarization. Ajá, que tiene que ver con cómo nos volvemos eh, 
menos dependientes de las instituciones. Which has to do with how we become less dependent on institutions. A partir de construir eh, y generar dentro de comunidad. Based on uh, uh, building and generating within our communities. Es, espacios de construcción colectiva y eh, recuperación histórica. Spaces for uh, collective construction and historical recuperation. Eh, para imaginar nuevos mundos. To imagine new worlds and new possibilities. Eh, y bueno, lo que comentaban de, de la discusión entre eh, ser cooptado o no cooptado por la universidad. In reference to what, we, what was being saying, said about being co-opted or not co-opted by uh, the university. Y insisto en que te, descentralizar es justo eh, entender nuestro actuar y de, de colonial. I insist colonial. that our uh, uh, that our action needs to be uh, decolonize the colonial. De, 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 de colonial. De, decolonize and deinstitutionalize. Fuera de las de las instituciones del mismo estado. Outside of the institutions provided by the state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, gracias. Yeah, that is all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Samson, Gajendran, any last thoughts before we close the session? Uh, uh, I'd make a counterintuitive kind of closing remark. Yeah? First is quoting Fanon from the end of uh, Conclusion to Wretched of the Earth, where he makes a solicitation for us to generate new concepts, make new combinations, make new cerebral connections, and bring forth a new human. Uh, with regard to the question of the university uh, and decolonizing the university, just like what you're doing with philosophy, epistemologies, religion, and other things, uh, it's we have to be non-presentist. Uh, often when we think about the university, we think of it as this Western installation, while the reality is that the oldest university in the world yeah, is found in Fez, Morocco. Yeah, well, way before you have, around 200 years before you have a university in Bologna, Italy today. Uh, so when one thinks of the university, for instance, uh, we have to be able to contextualize. Uh, is it this neoliberal formation uh, that is captured in so many ways that one is critical of? Or is it a different kind of institution that has got a broader history that we often do not even know of when we talk about the university? And when we start making these explorations, when you start you know, carrying out a much more, you know, when you're invested in decolonizing the university, do the history, yeah? Find out well, how has it come to hold such a powerful place in so many societies in the world. Uh, and in a very modular way, such that that becomes a thing that you decolonize. But also, are there other trajectories? Are there other traditions? Are there other ways in which these spaces of knowledge have operated in different parts of the world? So for me, it's that kind of encouragement, but also to know that the work of decolonizing is a constant struggle. Yeah, It's painful work. It's work that sometimes isolates, so that it's important to make connections, friendships. It's a work of love, if you like. Yeah? But it's work that also demands constant play. It's very serious work, so you must play, yeah? given its seriousness. And that is how you also open up other possibilities. Um, maybe I'll quickly chip in, um, connecting what uh, Sabiha and Amy and then uh, Samson said. Uh, as far as the academy is concerned, in a way, Shubhranshu uh, put this point up when, when he invited us for this um, uh, talk. Um, so is there a possibility at all decolonizing uh, the academy as it exists? I, I, I've been living in the West for the past 20 years and you know, so I've spent uh, more than a decade in the US now in, in, in Germany for more than six years. And, and, and uh, I'm, I'm really not sure. Uh, the, for example, South Asian studies, is there anything I've, I've come across, in, you know, South Asians with a very clear Marxist perspective, with, um, uh, liberals and uh, all of them. And 
but I'm fully not sure whether they are sincere about uh, radical transformation of so you know um, the academy. I'm, I'm deeply dissatisfied with uh, you know the, for example the post-colonial school, fully dominated by the privileged. You don't even come across uh, you know the middle class and the lower class and, and the marginalized people at all. So uh, I'm, I'm completely so soon. I'm going to make a, a writing and as well as a presentation on the failure of post-colonial theory. Um, regarding South Asia. Um, so they are interested in marginalizing and or provincializing Europe, but definitely not provincializing the privilege within South Asia. So given the situation, South Asian studies and anthropologies of you know, different regions, could this ever be decolonized? I'm fully not sure. I'm, I'm a little really pessimistic about it. Uh, but, I, I, but on the other hand, I go with what Samson said. It's a struggle for me intellectually. I believe in... Um, you know, conceptual formation, new ideas, that I see tremendous potentialities. And that we need to, it's a big challenge. It's, it's, it's brain draining and that we have to do it. And there is a scope, uh, one. And then, you know, uh, and it has got to be like Sabiha and Samson, it's, it has got to be transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary. I, 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 that's why my most recent article is going to be published in History and Anthropology Journal, connecting um, myself with memory of the marginalized. Um, so interdisciplinary approaches. I'm not satisfied with anthropology or history or uh, you know other disciplines. I want to bring in, if you want to speak about the oppressed and the marginalized and their own positive identity and cultures, I cannot be very orthodox about I am an anthropologist or I am a historian. I have to sort of crisscross the boundaries of disciplines to take in ideas to engage with. So, and then that's in Emmy's perspective of how do you bring in the indigenous voices? And, and, and Amy also very clearly said that there's a need for us to interlink academy with non-academic institutions and practices. Probably this can put more pressure on academy to take the marginalized voices seriously. So that kind of uh, academic, non-academic institutions and activists and scholars coming together, trying their ideas seem to be extremely important. If at all, we need to have some new grounds to break. Uh, for a better understanding of the modulation and oppressed communities across the world. So thank you so much. Go. I mean, thank you everyone. Before I, I invite Angeline to tell us about the next session, I think, uh, you know, th thanks to all our panelists today for this extremely enlightening uh, talk. And I think uh, what the uh, message that we get is, you know, to decolonize is to resist. It is also to create, it is also to rediscover. It is also to agitate and organize, uh, uh, you know, and it is to, uh, you know, uh, work within the academy, outside the academy, uh, and working collaboratively. Uh, so that's the message that we get. If at all we have to decolonize, these are the aspects that we have to be very uh, true to. So uh, uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, Ange Angeline, uh, uh, to you. Over to you. Um, I'm sure everyone uh, joins me in thanking Shibranshu and Maria Ventura for conceptualizing uh, this, this seminar and uh, inviting the speakers, putting it together, uh, making it happen. So thank you so much for what's genuinely been um, an engaging and a challenging session, that one that's made us work hard, which is always a good thing. So thank you very much. Um, I would like to say before closing to uh, draw attention to, um, I'm hoping that the, you will see a shared screen soon, to draw attention to the next seminar. So what, the event bike page isn't quite ready, but it will be ready very, very shortly. I uh, think in the next, uh, by Monday, <laughs> I'm hoping, that's the latest, um, on decolonizing ethics. Uh, so we have a panel for that, so, uh, Professor Madhu Krishnan, Professor Leon Tickley, who will talk about post-colonial ethics, uh, Dr. Jesse Sanza and Carolina Valderas will be collaborating with Bet Zabe Torresales to uh, put together uh, a panel for that. But I'm aware that decolonizing ethics, the ethics in particular, from some of the kind of conversations that we've had so far in these first two sessions, it's an area where people have kind of come up against the colonized nature of the academy in a very hard and uh, brutal way sometimes. And it's been frustrating and that it has been hurtful for some 
people. So there'll be, I'll put, uh, there will also be a padlet for that, so people can kind of put up some uh, dilemmas or some uh, ex uh, experiences that they've had so that we can in some way be responsive to that and perhaps have a different type of debate and interaction somehow. I'm not clear how we'll do that. Um, but I'm just aware that there is so much experience and knowledge amongst our participants uh, with respect to, the, to this issue. Of course, we then have the final two um, seminars uh, on uh, decolonizing methodology and decolonizing writing representation in January. So please do hold those, those dates. Thank you. Um, I put in the chat a link to the uh, decolonizing knowledge in teaching and research practice. Uh, that's a new uh, research, kind of pop-up research group, I think it's been described as, at the University of Bath. But it's, you know, it, other people are welcome to to, be, to network and uh, engage with that. And I pop, put up the link so that you can find out more about that. Uh, we are keen that this seminar series should bring people together, it should form networks that can carry on um, you know, sustaining those people who are doing doctoral research, can carry on sustaining them through their doctoral research and beyond, and sustaining academics as, um, as well who are working, uh, more established academics who, who are working in this area. So thank you very much. Uh, I forget now all that's left is for us to kind of do the online equivalent of an applause. Some people are very good at doing that in, in, in the chat. Some of us just have to clap our hands. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you.